Hello, and welcome to our new series, Her Stories, where we will welcome guests to honor and tell the stories of women, past and present, who have served this nation. I'm Phyllis Wilson, president of the Military Women's Memorial, located here at the ceremonial entrance to Arlington National Cemetery. Today, I would like to welcome Shannon Huffman Polson, a Duke University grad. Shannon was commissioned as a second lieutenant in Army Aviation and was one of the first women to fly Apache helicopters. After her service in the Army, she joined the corporate world. And today she is the founder of the Grit Institute and the author of the new book, The Grit Factor, Courage, Resilience and Leadership in the Most Male Dominated Organization in the World where she shares accounts of trailblazing women that have learned to lead at the highest levels, overcame adversity, and navigated change. So Shannon, welcome to her stories. Thank you, Phyllis. The first day that I walked out on the tarmac toward the Apache helicopter, the helicopter I was going to fly, was a winter day at Fort Rucker, Alabama. And I had shivers going up and down my spine, although they had very little to do with the temperature. I walked out on the tarmac towards that aircraft and saw it crouching there, lined up with other helicopters also seeming to crouch there. It's 58 feet long, the Apache is 12 feet high, 18 feet wide, powered by two 1850 horsepower jet engines. On its nose hangs three sight systems that see in day and night and infrared. On its wings hangs any combination of the 2.75 inch folding funereal rocket and the Hellfire anti-tank missile. I walked out on the tarmac towards that aircraft, the most technologically advanced helicopter in the world. And I thought, who am I to fly this thing? I was an English major in college. <laughs> and right there in that moment on the tarmac, I had to make a decision. I had to decide to be better than any of the doubts that I was feeling than any of the doubts that I had started to hear expressed around me about why women think they need to fly this thing anyway. Right there on the tarmac in that moment, I had to decide that I was going to own my own story, that I was going to take control of my own narrative because who was I not to fly this thing? So I walked out, put one foot up onto the wheel, the other foot up onto the forward avionics bay, opened that all glass cockpit that opens up and out like a Lamborghini. I've never been in a Lamborghini, but really, if you fly the Apache, who needs to? Swung myself into that front seat, lowered myself into the seat, and attached that five-point harness, began the run-up procedure that I would know so well that I would know it by heart, but I would always use the checklist. And then we began to taxi out towards takeoff. Now, I like to ask audiences if you know which way you take off in the Apache helicopter. Many of them will say up, sometimes backwards. But of course, in the Apache, like in any other aircraft, you turn the nose to face the wind. And when you use it the right way, the resistance will help you to rise. It's such a pleasure to be here to help to support the beginning of her stories with the Women's Memorial. It's truly an honor to support the mission of this incredible organization with the grit factor and with the stories and the lessons learned that came from the incredible leaders that really formed the basis of what became the grit factor. I started to do this work about seven years ago when a young Lieutenant reached out to me and asked me to mentor her as she began her leadership journey. And all of a sudden I realized it had been a number of years since I had been in uniform. I transitioned through my MBA at the Tuck School at Dartmouth and then spent time at both Boston Scientific and Microsoft. And surely my experience integrating into an all male field must have been somewhat unique. So I wondered how I could scale the advice that I was able to give to her. And if I did that work, then scale the people to whom that advice was available. And that was the genesis of the grit factor. I started several years of interviewing leaders in the vanguard of their fields. They all happened to be women. They all happened to be military. Early women, general officers, a combat rescue swimmer from the Coast Guard, three generations of aviators from World War II to the present, one of the first women army rangers, one of the first women to serve on submarines and many, many more. And these stories form the basis 
for what became the grit factor, breaking lessons out for you to apply in your life as well. Commit, learn, and then launch. Now, one of the lessons that came out very, very clearly from all of these leaders was that a leader has to know about the story that matters the most. Now in the military, we're very connected to the story of the military, the mission and the vision and the values and the people we're serving with. And those are all very important. But leaders seem to understand that they had to start with the most important story. And that story was the one that they told themselves. I want to tell you briefly about when I learned that. It was before that time on the tarmac at Fort Rucker. I was still just a cadet, just a college student at Duke University. I'd been in ROTC since my freshman year. I'd been part of the simultaneous membership program with the National Guard for the last two years of my college time. And towards the end of my senior year in 1993, I drove out to Raleigh, North Carolina to the state aviation office to receive my assignment for the years ahead. I reported to a colonel that sat behind a desk that seemed as wide as this room with shiny plate glass windows that ran up behind him. And I tried not to shake and I stood at attention and he asked me to sit down and we exchanged a couple of pleasantries back and forth before the interchange I would never forget. When he stopped mid-sentence, leaned back in his chair, looked down his nose at me and said, you realize cadet that you will never fly an attack aircraft. Well, I looked back at him and I recognized his comment for what it was meant to be, which was small and mean and cutting because at the time attack aircraft weren't open for women to fly. But I'd also been around just long enough to realize there are times that you say, yes, sir. And so I said, yes, sir, drove back to the ROTC detachment on the campus of Duke University and requested a transfer out of the National Guard and onto active duty. Later that year, I reported to Fort Rucker, Alabama. And in the meantime, Congress changed the game on that colonel and everyone else lifted the combat exclusion clause and suddenly every aircraft in the inventory was open to women and men to fly. And I thought that the sky was the limit. I include this picture from our graduation class. The front row are the honor grads. And I made very sure that there would be a skirt in that front row. <laughs> Needless to say, I earned the opportunity. I asked for the opportunity and I transitioned into the opportunity to fly the AH-64A Apache attack helicopter. I would arrive later that year to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 229th Attack Aviation Regiment, the Army's 18th Airborne Corps. It was the contingency corps, the tip of the spear, ready to deploy anywhere in the world within 18 hours. And at age 23, I was the only woman pilot out of 120 male combat pilots. I could tell you several other anecdotes that made the one from that first colonel pale in comparison. Mm. And what I realized at that point and many points along the way is if I didn't own my own story, I would implicitly be accepting a limiting narrative from somebody else and from the culture that was around me. A leader knows she has to own her own story first. Now, one thing that became very clear as I did this research that formed the basis for the grit factor, supported, of course, by all the scientific, the leadership, the management, the psychology research that, that underpins all of the aspects of grit and leadership, is that grit is not this discrete characteristic off the shelf at mile 23 of the marathon and we put it back on the shelf and we're done, but it's something that's part of the whole leader. It's part of the makeup of our character. And the grit factor breaks out into three sections because of the stories and the lessons learned shared so generously by the leaders that form the basis of the research. The first piece is commit. That's deep internal work that correlates to really owning and shaping your past. And then it's deep engagement in the present. That's dr drawing your circle or building your team. That's learning to listen first, be an active listener, and then that's building the skills of grit and resilience that will serve you throughout your career and your life. And then finally is launch. That's that forward looking focus that is both grounded in the past, that past that you have shaped and owned. It is connected to that present in which you're fully engaged and looking towards the future with audacity, being willing to take risks, being willing to take on stretch assignments, understanding that failure as Churchill said is not final. And like I like to say, it's not failure that matters, it's what you do with it that counts. Also authenticity. Leaders 
who were able to sustain their leadership throughout a long career understood early on that they had to be authentic. They had to be true to who they were. And ultimately, adaptability. That's something that everyone in the military learns very early on that perhaps all of us have learned in 2020. But all three of these phases, commit, learn, and launch, correlating to past, present, and future, have to be surrounded by a mindset of what I like to call grounded optimism. And we'll get to that in just one moment. When I talk to audiences across the country and around the world, one of the things that we talk about is where do you start with your own story? Most people haven't done this deep internal work. It's very easy to jump ahead to the mission, especially in the military when it's so clearly articulated and the stakes are so high. So where do you start? Not yet again with the organization. In this commit phase, this is the deep internal work of knowing who you are as a leader first before you can offer all of your skills to support the organization. I like to call this next exercise, drilling down to core purpose. Now my very first assignment at Fort Bragg, North Carolina was not the platoon that every single Lieutenant both covets and needs to be able to learn and to demonstrate leadership, to be able to fly that Apache that I'd just been trained on. But I was the assistant to the assistant operations officer so I was a back office lackey typing up, not the operations orders themselves, but the appendices and the indices for the operations orders, usually starting around six o'clock at night. Now, of course I did the best job I could. I got great feedback, but I went to the captain I was working for. And I said, sir, listen, I'm gonna keep doing the best job I can at the work I've been given, but when does that platoon gonna open up? And he looked back at me and said, Lieutenant, the army doesn't owe you anything. So I kept doing my work and later on a major that we were all working for called us into work on a Saturday for no apparent reason. And I remember him looking over at me halfway through the day and saying, don't worry, Lieutenant, you'll be married by the time you're 25. Oh. Well, I've been around just long enough to know I didn't have to say yes, sir, to everything. And so I didn't say yes, sir. But I went to see him that next week and said, sir, I think I can do more. I'm gonna keep doing the best job I can at the work I've been given, but I think I can do more. And he looked surprised and he gave me one additional duty after the other and I made sure I hit everyone out of the park. And then I finally took that platoon. But that's the story I tell you because at various points along the way, not only do people try to give you a different narrative that may be limiting, but you also have to be connected to your core purpose to get through those times when you simply don't have control over the situation. Now, we like to talk about starting with why. Starting with why is a great place to start, but it sometimes doesn't go nearly far enough because in that operation shop, had I asked myself, why, why am I here? I would have answered, well, I'm here to fly the Apache. I'm here to be an aviation leader, but I wouldn't have gotten very far because I had very little control over how that shop was run and what it was that I was going to be assigned to do. But what if you ask yourself why not one time, but five times? Go not to purpose, but to core purpose, heart purpose, that thing that belongs only to you. This is a technique that I borrowed from Toyota and Toyota put this in place as a manufacturing technique to drill down into the root cause of deficiencies, but we're gonna borrow it here to go from purpose to core purpose. Why was I there? I was there to fly the Apache helicopter, to be an aviation leader. Why? I was trained to do so. Why? I had asked for, I had earned that opportunity. Why? Because I wanted to serve my country. That's pretty good, right? But force yourself to go even deeper. Why? Because I wanted to serve. Service was the value and the purpose that was at the heart of why it was that I was there. And when you connect to that core purpose that belongs only to you, you can weather any of the turbulence that comes your way. Mindset, it turns out, matters a lot too. Leaders know they have to own their own story. They know they have to connect to their core purpose. This is something that came out in a couple of different dissertations on general officers across the services, as well as female general officers just in the Marine Corps and the research that I did for the grip factor. So that's pretty clear. The mindset matters and it matters a lot. Now there's two different ways to look at mindset. I just mentioned the one earlier that surrounds that grit triad, right? That commit, learn and launch, past, present and future. Grounded optimism is what pulls that all together, what underpins it as well. 
So let's talk about that first. And the second part is the work that Carol Dweck at Stanford has done on growth mindset. Both of these aspects of mindset are absolutely critical. So let's start again with grounded optimism. Now, many of you will know the Stockdale paradox, right? Admiral Stockdale shot down over Vietnam, captured almost immediately in the Hanoi Hilton for over seven years, had his legs broken three times in solitary confinement for over half of his time there. And when he was finally released at the end of the war, they said, what was the difference between those who lived and those who died? And he said, it's easy. The answer is optimism. Those optimists are the ones who died. They died of a broken heart. Easter would come and go. They would expect to be released and nothing happened. They'd say, surely the war is going to be over in the summer and nothing happened. He said, you must never, ever lose that ultimate faith in the end, that you will ultimately prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose with a absolutely brutal understanding of the realities of your day-to-day. -day. So that's what grounded optimism is. It doesn't make light of anything. It's not Pollyannish. It doesn't have rose-colored glasses to say something is better than it is. But it also never loses faith that ultimately we will come through this, whatever that challenge might be, and we'll come through it together. Now that second part of mindset, this is the Carol Dweck work. And Carol Dweck did amazing work around something that's been started to be understood as growth mindset. There's several other studies that have been, continued to build on this as well. But at the end of the day, when I talk to people about grit, the question always comes up, is grit just something you have or you don't have? Some people have more of it and some people have less. And the reality is that Carol Dweck showed that the science is very clear that grit is innate to every single one of us. And that's certainly been my experience after leaving the military as well. It's not confined to military pilots or people in uniform. Grit is something that is a characteristic that can be built, it can be trained, and you get better at doing hard things by guess what? By doing hard things. When I spoke at West Point a couple of years ago, we talked about how you get better at push-ups. You don't get better at push-ups by going for a run, you get better at push-ups by doing push-ups. The same thing is true here. The mindset that understands that going through challenge will actually make you better allows you to navigate those difficulties with much greater ease. Courage of ownership. I love talking to corporate audiences about this because you know when the military does this, we do it better than anybody else. Courage of ownership is the exciting stuff. It's where you get stuff done. It's where you make things happen. And it's also really scary. And one of the things that comes out again and again is that these leaders that I interviewed for the grit factor and my own experience as well, they weren't at all immune to fear. There were lots of times that they were afraid. There were lots of times I was afraid. I was afraid when we had been locked on with hostile radar in Bosnia. I was afraid asking for my first platoon. I was afraid asking to take my company command. And one thing that Major General Don Dunlop of the US Air Force will tell every young leader is never be afraid to ask for what you want. But that doesn't mean it's not scary. And pretty much everyone who's worn the uniform understands that there's fear that's part of this job in one way or another. So what do you do with fear? And what do you do when you fail too, right? Because leaders understand that failure is part of the path to success. What about fear? Understand that it's a completely normal human emotion. And you remember what we did on takeoff with resistance, right? Well, what if we consider fear as just another form of resistance. This is what every leader of the grit factor shared in one way or another. What do you do with that fear? That kind of resistance? You turn towards it and you fly directly through it. We're gonna come in for a landing now. I know we have some, a fun question and answer period here to follow. But remember again with the grit factor, commit, learn and launch. The grit is not unique just to those of us who have worn the uniform. The uniform doesn't give us grit. That's part of who we are. That's part of who you are. It's part of our character. It's part of our personalities. And it's something that can be built. And that's a really key thing to remember. Because I think sometimes we consider grit as something that was part of a different experience that we might have had or part of the time that we wore the uniform. But grit is innate to every single one of us. It can be built. It's part of our past. It's part of our present, it's part of our future. 
and it's an honor to bring the stories and the lessons learned shared so generously by the leaders of the Grip Factor to you. I hope you'll enjoy the book and I look forward to our question and answer. Wow, Shannon, that was awesome. So I, I just have one quick aside to that. I was stationed at Fort Bragg for, for a time myself. And in 1992, I was a proud wow. brand new paratrooper, had just graduated jump school oh down gosh. at Fort Benning and, uh, and was stationed up at 18th Airborne Corps. For you and I, we completely understand the difference, but, but my husband was assigned at 82nd. And so I would go down to the 82nd part of Fort Bragg to meet him for lunch while sporting my proud maroon beret on top of my head with my jump wings on my chest, I was a proud paratrooper. And I walked down there as a young officer and uh, these young enlisted soldiers, they looked me dead in the eye, but they walked right by without a salute. And it was just one of those days, oh. it happened more than once before, but I see your face. <laughs> um, it had happened previously. <laughs> it was just the, the day I chose not to, to your, to your point about, you know, don't be afraid to ask for something. And so I, excuse me, and they were about 10 feet past me and they stopped and I said, come back here, I wanna to talk to you. And they just stood fast. And I said, I said, then I, I sort of, I had have, I have children by then. I had, um, did the mom voice. I said, come back here. And so they walked back, but they okay. stood at parade rest and I was a warrant officer. And I thought, okay, I know you guys have to know. And I said, then I just went into full blown. I'd been an NCO, I'd been a sergeant. And so I, I knew how to do that voice and the hand and, and I read them the riot act. They locked up into the right position of attention. And I asked them, I said, you looked me dead in the eye, yet you walked by and, and chose not to salute me, why? And they looked at each other a little sheepishly, but one of them stood up straight and said, ma'am, our first sergeant said, he doesn't know why any woman jumps out of an airplane. You'll never jump into combat. You're sucking up a jump slot that a man should have. Wow. That's what I thought. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know what? Let's go talk to your first sergeant. These were young troops that were being taught wrong. And it was, right. it was like, I could, I could chew, the, chew them up and spit them out. And all they know is she's a witch. And I didn't want that. Right. I haven't been an NCO. I thought, this is wrong. Why are you doing this to these young soldiers? So I went back up and it was systemic within that organization down there at 82nd. When I went into um, the orderly room for anybody that's not tracking, it's sort of like your, your front office. You walk in and normally when any officer walks into an, a room with just enlisted soldiers, they stand up. Nobody stood up. And when I said I wanted to speak with the first sergeant, all they said was, I'm sorry, he's not in today. Then I'll speak right. with the command sergeant majors. Like, like you go to a store and you don't like what you're getting and you're like, can I talk to your supervisor? So that's why I, let me talk to his supervisor. And they said, oh, he's in the building next door. So I stood there thinking she's going to pick up the phone and call over there and say that somebody, and uh, I waited a minute. I said, um, are you going to call him? She's like, no, that's, that's the command sergeant major. He's in the building next door. You need to go over there. And I said, I don't think you understand why I'm here. Please call him and tell him that you have, and, and I mean, it's easy in the military. You look at the rank, you look at the nameplate, you know who you got. Okay. Tell him I'm here and I want to speak with him. So he came over. We had a very interesting conversation. I said, listen, you know, the old guard is changing and we're coming in here. And I didn't think I was a, a groundbreaker, a trailblazer or anything, but I just simply said, don't do that to these young soldiers because things are changing. And of course, you know, 93 was a big year for us in the military, women in the military and, and our rights and, uh, and ability to serve and do amazing things it just in the, and that was the early 90s and look at where we are today so yeah i completely can understand and appreciate i can't imagine being the only of 120 plus uh you know attack aviators out there um because I've, I've done my time at rucker but only because i'm a warrant and so all army warrant officers spend not the best years of our lives and we are harassed and harangued at fort fort rucker as well so so thank you for all of that. One yeah, of the questions yeah. I do have for you, there are so many tactics that you have given us, great tools within this book yeah. and the grit factor. 
to help us sort of take control. Well, now we're talking about COVID. So how is it possible to, to take control in a constantly changing environment like we're seeing now? Yeah, and I think it's such a good question because there are other things that are less extreme, but certainly that is the perfect example. And I think it's been a time where I realize clients are sharing that people are not only anxious, I mean, anxiety is, is extremely high, but also truly viscerally afraid because there's a real physical threat as well as unknowns and the, the political situation and the economic situation, the social situations are all really volatile right now. So there's real fear as well as an unknown horizon, right? And I think, uh, and again, going back to whether it's a Stockdale paradox or also I, of course, speak about Rhonda Cornum in the book who was a female POW in the first uh, Iraq war. But either way, you know, the POWs didn't go into their, their captivity understanding when or if there would be an end to that, right? And so I think that's a good reminder that um, you look at the very long-term horizon and Admiral Stockdale, of course, used the words that you must never lose faith that you will ultimately prevail, right? At some point, you don't know the horizon. That's pretty tough as a pilot to not have your horizon. You've got to fly in. It's Apache pilots don't like that at all. Uh, but, um, but the other thing that I really recommend to people is, is look a long way out. I mean, like two to three years and look forward to something specific. Maybe it's something at your work. Maybe it's a family vacation, but it's something that's realistic in two to three years. I think looking out three months, we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but then you have something to plan for and anticipate in the distant future. The other thing is to really look at where you do have control, right? And even look within a week period, a one week period, look for very small goals and very small gains and truly hold on to those and celebrate those because that's the, the sphere of influence that we have has shrunk to a large degree and that makes all of us uncomfortable. But when you can really connect to those small things over which you do have control, there is a sense of agency that, that helps to uh, ease some of that anxiety. So both looking close in and far out is, is number one. The second thing is an exercise and this is part of the Army's Master Resilience Training Program. It's part of every single program of well-being back to every ancient religion that you'll ever uh, ever study or know about which is to take time each day to truly focus on the things for which you're grateful for. And, and it's pretty clear, the science is really clear that that changes your brain. It changes the way that you look at things and it makes you grittier. It gives you grit, it gives you resilience, it builds those muscles. And so that very simple exercise of gratitude is a wonderful addition to however it is that you focus your time on a day-to-day -day basis. That's interesting because I did go through some of the resiliency training that the Army provided. Um, as a senior leader, we were certainly given a lot more inroads into that. And I remember the first day we walked in, there was a beautiful, very nice journal and a very pretty pen sitting on the table and how we were to hunt the good stuff, right? And, and look for those things for which we're, yes. we're grateful for um, and how we, um, and, and really to take the time to at least try to find three things every day that we could say we were grateful for, that we were um, just happy to be a part of, sometimes looking for something bigger. Sometimes it's as simple as um, somebody leaves you a little piece of uh, Dove chocolate on your desk one day, you know, I'm like, okay, I needed that. Somebody knew that. And there it was. Plus when you unwrap the Dove little candies, there's always a cool slogan or something, some little, <laughs> you know, phrase Great. of advice or something uplifting within there. So let's talk a little bit more about um, times when you've questioned yourself and how did you pull your, you know, like, like you said, it, I've been afraid many times, but how do you, how do you get your arms around the fact it's okay to be afraid, but what am I going to do next? How do you, how do you work through that? Yeah, you know, I've, um, I mean, I could give you examples. I feel like every day where I doubt myself or doubt something that it is that I'm doing. And certainly as a young leader, that was the case as well. Um, and I've really started to, and this is just actually in the last few months, I'm starting to kind of put some structure around this thinking. It's a conscious active decision every day and it's not, it's different than fake it till you make it, right? I, I don't actually necessarily agree with that. I, but I do think you have to make a conscious and active decision to 
be confident enough to use the resources that have been given to you. All of us have enough resources to be able, whatever they are, to be able to affect positive change, to be able to contribute, to be able to learn, and to actively choose confidence. And I do think that there is a choice to be made there. That doesn't mean that you don't have some self-doubts or that, especially if you're asking for that stretch assignment or you're pushing yourself, that you don't still wonder if, if you're quite ready. That's completely normal and natural. But I think you choose what to focus on. And when you choose to focus on the task and you choose to present yourself with confidence, uh, I think those are active decisions that we make every day and truly every moment of every day as we face challenges. And, uh, and I think that's something you start to learn as a young leader out of necessity and probably start to put some understanding to that uh, as you get a little bit more senior. Wow. Yeah. So as I went through the book, I was really caught because here, of course, at the Military Women's Memorial, um, I'm only the third president, although we, the, the foundation for which we have was founded back in the 80s. But Brigadier General Wilma Vaught, <laughs> amazing, stalwart, amazing leader. Um, only uh, stopped serving and is now president emeritus just a few years ago. And, and so Major General D. McWilliams, who's in your book, and had I learned things in yeah. there that I, and I know her, and I thought, she never told me some of those stories. So uh, thank you for capturing and for her opening up and telling you those. But she was the Major General D. McWilliams Army, was the second president to the memorial and the foundation here. And, and to for about a year now, I've been the third president. And I will tell you one of those questions that I had because we had a brigadier general and a major general, and now we have a chief warrant officer five. And I wasn't going to apply because I really felt like, well, this is a general's kind of a, a job that gets these and, and unfortunately, another general said it will stay that way until somebody that isn't a general officer that's qualified applies for these kind of opportunities. And so uh, that and a, a couple other things that transpired and just as, as um, I think General Horaho calls them God nudges. It, it's like you just happen to be in a window of time. Something weird happens that like, OK, why? That was the tipping point that made me put my, my application in to apply for this. And so here I am and I can't right. ask for a better job. But one of the things that we do here, of course, is tell the stories of the nearly 3 million women that have defended this nation, you and I being just two of them. And so we have what we call our, yes. our register, right? Where we try to get every woman that has ever served whether for a very short period of time or for 40 plus years, it doesn't matter. All of us knitted together make this incredible story of grittiness, the factors that we've all pulled together that without what they have done for us in the past, like you talk about the women Air Force service pilots in World War II, that a little over a thousand women, 38 of whom died doing their job and it took right. them until 1977 to be recognized as truly as veterans. So uh, these are the stories that we exactly. try to capture and we're launching a national registration campaign to get 100,000 new women's stories recorded into our digital repository. This, it's the only thing like it in the world that anybody can come here and type in oh. Shannon, name and find her story pop up, her photo, her times of service, her awards and decorations, and her most memorable experiences, which I find fascinating. And uh, I've changed mine over yeah. time. And that's the great thing is that those memorable experiences can, can shift and change, especially if somebody registers while they're still in service. So we don't want people to wait. And while it is called uh Military Women's Memorial, it's a living memorial and this education center that I'm sitting in to tell the stories of the women currently, as well as those that have come before us on whose shoulders we stand. So I'm, I'm just so fascinated so about everything you've done. Go ahead. Well, I have to say it's such an honor to be, to be able to work with you on this because I really never had that feeling of sorority, I think, uh, when I was serving. And I understand that that's a little bit different to me. But I do think that your work with the Military Women's Memorial is part of, the, is part of developing that sorority. And 
really with the grip factor, I will say what the thing that was, it's such an honor to bring this book out. And I wrote it because it was a book that I was just shocked it wasn't already out there. I mean, women have been doing these incredible things for such a long time. And uh, of course, I only, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people, but there's so many more with these incredible experiences. So it truly is an honor to have the grit factor in the world to bring these stories and these lessons learned. And I, my initial intent was not to have any indication that that they were all women leaders who were interviewed for the book because I wanted it to be a book that is for women and men. Uh, and you know, if you had a leadership book that just interviewed men, nobody even blinks twice, right? Um, but these are right. leaders who had to go like everyone in your registry then that, that will be in the registry, all these 3 million women have had to undergo a double crucible in many cases where it's not just the challenges of the military of the job, which is significant. But in a number of cases, they're literally fighting day to day to be in an environment that's not always welcoming. And I know sometimes we, those are hard conversations, but I think that's, uh, it's really worth recognizing that there is just incredible grit that is part of that experience for every single one of these, these leaders. Absolutely. And so while this is the first launch is of the initial video of our Her Stories casting here, the series, but, but because of the book, we actually are getting so many, you have nearly three dozen women's stories that are being told in there. So it's, it truly is not just a her story, it's her stories that are all within here. And I tell you, so uplifting to read about Alda, who, who's flying a Coast Guard helicopter, and there is a man in the water in trouble, and they don't have a rescued uh, swimmer to go in. She has a student pilot with her that she says, take, take the control. And she jumped in the water to save this man. Oh my gosh, right? You're gonna get some great stories if you grab this book. So where's the best place to, to get your hands on this book, Shannon? You can get it anywhere books are sold. I'm a big fan of picking it up from an independent bookseller because it helps to introduce them and others to the book as well. But you'll also find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, and pretty much anywhere else that books are sold. So I do hope you'll pick up copies for yourself and your team. And if you find me at shannonpolson.com, there's a virtual book signing link and you can add your name and address and I can send you a signed sticker to put in your book as well. As many as you like. I've signed 250 <laughs> for one company. <laughs> wow, yeah. wow. And, and I hope, you know, when they read these, they will see that it, it isn't a gender issue. It just happens to all be women. But just a couple of weeks ago, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was laid to rest here at Arlington and has been a great, without some of the legislation landmark that she carried forward, we also wouldn't be where we are in the military today. And uh, the reception after the, the funeral was here in where about where I'm sitting. <laughs> And so we had Supreme Court justices, family and friends that were here of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And one of the quotes that she uh, is attributed to her, was somebody asked her, how many women should be on the Supreme Court? And she thought for a second and she smiled shyly and said, nine. Nine, why nine? He said, nobody thought about it when there were nine men on the Supreme Court. What, what would be the problem if there were nine women? So That's again, Exactly right. No, I actually have a t-shirt with that on it. And, uh, and you know, to that, to that end, during that event and uh, during that, that special time, the infantry company, the old guard that lays those people like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and other, uh, other dignitaries to rest was led by Captain Shea Haber, who is also in the book, who is one of the first women army rangers and is in her second infantry company. Command. Yeah, and so, so that we, is another we, um, really important piece. We stole from that, and and uh, Kristen Grease, the other first grad ranger, was out front of the memorial. Yep. We had it draped in black for um, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg's motorcade came by. So we had an enlisted and an oh officer God. from all six services, including the Space Force. Um, so we had, you know, they were out there, and and Chris Greased, Captain Greased, was our uh, ranger rep, if you will, from the Army. Uh, that was out front and rendered, we have a beautiful photo of all of them rendering a salute as, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed the memorial draped in black. It's fantastic. And so once we definitely saw that Shea Haver had done it, we we're like, oh, we got to get Chris in here. So she was happy to, to support. We had a few folks that were lawyers and paralegals as well, military women 
that were able to stand out there and they, they were just, so I'm hopeful that when they register their, their most memorable experiences, they were one of the few women out front of the Women's Memorial at Arlington National Cemetery to honor Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So this is my call to action, asking everybody to one, get the grit factor, read about these amazing military women. And then my charge to each of you is please take the time, register yourself or a family member or a friend that you know that has served in the United States military and needs to take the rightful place here at the Military Women's Memorial. Thank you so much. And thank you to Shannon Huffman Polson and The Grit Factor. Register yourself or a loved one for free at womensmemorial.org.